Doubt is not a pleasant condition, but certainty is an absurd one. Voltaire. There are these two young fish swimming along, and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way, who nods at them and says, morning boys, how's the water? And the two young fish swim on for a bit, and then eventually one looks over at the other and says, what the hell is water? David Foster Wallace. Good morning. My name is Mr. Blanton. You're a friendly neighborhood econ teacher. You may also know me as the mid-range murderer for my Kobe-like jump shot. Whether you like it or not, we are back in school. And over the next three trimesters, we'll spend many hours inside and outside the classroom learning being educated. But what does it mean to be educated? What is the purpose of all those hours, all that toil in class and on the field? Today, I want to offer my perspective. To do it, I'll tell you my story about how I ended up at this podium. And if you're already bored, I get it. I'm boring. But it's not my story that matters. What matters is the truth I believe it reflects. I graduated from Lyman High School in Orlando, Florida with just above a 3.0 GPA. I was the kind of student that just went about my business. I did the work, checked the boxes, jumped the right hoops. If I were to call any of my high school teachers, they would all likely ask the same question. You became a teacher? Their surprise shouldn't be that surprising. I floated through high school, smart enough to get by, but disengaged. I cared more about not getting bad grades to avoid making my parents angry. I did the bare minimum. I started at Seminole Community College the fall after my high school graduation in 2009. I attended because my parents wanted me to. Like high school, I did what I was supposed to, but my heart wasn't in it. In my first semester, I got a C in creative writing. I'm not sure how you get a C in creative writing, I mean, you make stuff up and there aren't many wrong answers. Uh, sorry, Mr. Court. Um, that C was a reflection of where I was. I felt aimless. In my second semester, I took the second half of the American History Survey, which covered from the end of the Civil War in 1865 to the 1990s. Now, my dad has always loved American history. He has a unique almost quirky obsession with the Pacific Campaign during World War II. And to this day, he believes that World War II was the height of American power and American greatness. So that was my understanding of American history when I sat in that Seminole Community College classroom. World War II was our pinnacle. The teacher, Mr. Camilli, was a portly guy with a thick Boston accent. The kind of guy who bragged about going to Harvard and how it made him a proud liberal. In class, he often ranted more about politics than taught us American history. Some students joked that sitting in the front row was, quote, the splash zone, because he could get so worked up sometimes that spit might fly about randomly. Despite his wackiness, Mr. Camilli might be the best teacher I've ever had. Not because he was a perfect teacher, he wasn't. 
but his version of American history was very different from my dad's. For my dad, the American story is about ascent and decline. We began our rise to greatness when we fought for and established the principles of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Our decline didn't begin until after World War II as Americans be became soft from their own comfort and power. But for Camille, the American story wasn't about ascent and decline. It was about sin and hypocrisy. We proclaimed freedom but had to fight a civil war to end human bondage. We proclaimed a right to happiness but often excluded immigrants from seeking it here because of their religion or race. We proclaimed democracy but allowed money and power to corrupt the principle of popular sovereignty. We proclaimed the right of national self-determination but often toppled governments during the Cold War that seemed suspiciously communist. For Camille, America always failed to live up to its principles. He believed that we were never really that great. And do I think Camille was right about everything? No, I don't. But he gave me a great gift, the gift of self-doubt. He presented me with a choice that I was never really aware I had. I could choose my dad's certainties as my own and dismiss Camille as a nutcase or choose to take him seriously as a person of good faith. I chose to doubt my old certainties, to rethink what I always assumed was just true. And that's the point of David Foster Wallace's famous 2005 commencement speech, This is Water. If we assume that our realities and our truths are all that matter, we will remain unconscious and unaware of the wonder and possibilities surrounding us. We will not have to think. Our truth becomes the truth, a prison we condition ourselves to believe is freedom. But real freedom is about recognizing that we always have a choice about how and what to think. We can continue to assume that our certainties are all that matter, or we can ask, am I wrong? Self-doubt is not an impediment to freedom. It is a necessary condition for it. Without doubt, there is no real thinking, and there is no real choosing. Without some nagging sense that what I believe might be wrong or misguided, we will live an automatic and thoughtless life. We will remain the young fish, trapped in our heads and unaware of the complex, nuanced, and beautiful realities we swim in every day. Although Mr. Camilli doesn't know it, he put me on a path that brought me to Westminster School. He helped me to realize that being educated isn't about content or knowledge. It isn't about memorizing information, facts, or formulas. It's an attitude, an invitation to constantly and persistently rethink what we believe and why we believe it, to see the world and the people in it anew again and again. The alternative is blind certainty, boredom, arrogance. You'll believe that your experience and knowledge are how to measure everyone and everything. There are no questions to ask because you are sure you already have the answers. The only hope to escape that prison, as far as I can tell, is a strong dose of humility and self-doubt to open yourself to the possibility that you know less than you think you do. And if you never embrace that mindset, you'll never be educated, even if you earn bachelor's degrees, medical degrees, law degrees, doctorates, even if you go on to make a lot of money, become famous, or change the world. 
Since being educated is always about being open to new ways of understanding the world, here's another way to think about what education means. Richard Hofstetter, a famous US historian, I'm sure Mr. Griffiths is over here smiling, uh, argued that an educated person has two essential qualities, piety and playfulness. Now, piety connotes religious belief, spiritual devotion to God or some religious creed. Of course, being educated does not require religious belief just as it does not exclude it. What it requires, however, is a commitment and devotion to a calling. What is that calling? Well, for a lack of a better phrase, let's call it the pursuit of truth. Nothing is safe, nothing is sacred except the pursuit of truth. To always ask why, especially when it hurts. Consider the famous story of Galileo, which some of you might already be familiar with. Galileo wrote about and taught the Copernican view that the earth revolved around the sun rather than the sun revolving around the earth. And although Galileo believed he had permission uh, to teach the Copernican view as a plausible hypothesis from the officials of the Catholic Church, he was summoned to defend his views after publishing a book in 1632 which laid out the arguments for heliocentrism. And after a formal inquisition, Galileo was found to be a purveyor of heresy, or a possible purveyor of heresy, which is false belief. And the church sentenced him to house arrest in 1633 for the remainder of his life. Now, his house arrest wasn't exactly like maximum security prison. Still, Galileo paid a meaningful price for pursuing the truth and sacrificed much personal freedom as a consequence. Galileo's example shows us the kind of intellectual piety that matters. You may not be called upon to overturn false theories, but you will be called upon to think for yourselves. Don't ever give that up. If being educated means devotion to the pursuit of truth, such a commitment should be balanced against another value, playfulness. The educated person may live for new ideas, for the pursuit of truth, but something must prevent them for living for one idea, one set of beliefs. An educated person plays with ideas. They entertain their possibility, persuasiveness, and power without necessarily accepting them as true. In my experience, certainty is seductive because it offers stability. It provides a tidy way of understanding the world that bestows psychological comfort. Whether such certainty comes in the form of politics, religion, the pursuit of riches, or some other system of meaning, it insulates an individual from what they don't know or refuse to consider. The mark of an educated person is intellectual empathy, always being willing to understand the perspective of others because maybe they know something you don't. And empathy is the antidote to arrogance, the cure to believing that you are the center of the world and that your certainties are all that matter. A truly educated person listens, considers different ideas and perspectives, and asks themselves over and over again, am I wrong. Of course, all this is easy to say. It's much harder to do in practice. Many times you'll fail just as I do. You'll dismiss the ideas of a friend because they just disagree with you. You'll ignore the feedback of a teacher because, well, they just don't understand the deep inner workings of your mind. You'll ignore the advice of a coach because you'll believe in your bones that you know better. You'll overlook the wisdom of a parent because, hey, that's what teenagers do. Of course, you could be right. The point is to stay open to the possibility that you're not. The lesson, this lesson, applies to all of us equally. Teachers, students, athletes, coaches, parents, and administrators alike. We are all engaged in the same process. None of us will always live up to the ideals of being 
educated, but we should strive to do it. Be pious in the pursuit of truth, but be playful too. Work hard to consider the ideas and opinions of others as thoughtfully as you can. Recognize that you always have a choice to think differently. And once you start to live this way, the world will seem a little different to you. You'll be less certain that a book or a class, learning a new sport, or yes, even listening to a chapel talk, is a waste of your time. Maybe it is, but maybe you'll get something out of it. You just have to be willing to listen, to believe that you could learn something. And if any of you are like me, choosing to embrace self-doubt and being willing to listen just might change your life. Thank you. Uh, join me in singing the Westminster Recessional.